and I will get the live stream started here. It's getting ready. I'll just give it a little bit here. All right, go ahead. Okay, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, you are in the Climate and Charismatic Water Birds session, and today we, and so just so you understand how this pre presentation is gonna go, we're gonna have about um, an hour total, so we're gonna have about 45 minutes for um, a, pre uh, a presentation, and then 10 to 15 minutes for questions. You can enter your questions into the Q&A as the presentation goes, and we will read them off at the end. And if you like a question, you can upvote it, and so if it's similar to a question you have, and then those questions will be answered soonest. But as of right now, um, I would like to introduce uh, Hillary Thompson and, and Andy Gossens of the International Crane Foundation. And today they are going to be talking about cranes in Wisconsin, past, present, and future. Hi everyone, thanks for coming to our talk today. Uh, like Jennifer said, my name is Hillary Thompson. I'm the North America Program Crane Analyst at the Crane Foundation. And I work primarily with whooping cranes in the Eastern Flyway, a reintroduced population of whooping cranes that breed here in Wisconsin. Um, so I'll be talking about the whooping cranes part of it today and I'll let Andy introduce himself. Hi everyone, my name is Andy Gossens. I'm the Sandhill Crane Project Manager here at the Crane Foundation. So. I obviously work a lot with sandhill cranes here in Wisconsin. So the International Crane Foundation uh, is a nonprofit organization based in Wisconsin, and we work worldwide to conserve cranes and the ecosystems, watersheds, and flyways on which they depend. Worldwide, there are 15 different species of cranes. Uh, you may recognize the ones that we have here in North America, but there are a uh, other species of cranes around the world, uh, most of which or all of which depend on wetlands in some capacity, but there are some that are more wetland dependent than others. 11 of the 15 species of cranes are listed as threatened or endangered, and so they are really a good uh, flagship species for wetland protections worldwide. North American crane species that you may recognize, we have two of them here in North America, the Sandhill crane, which hopefully many of you have seen. They're starting to migrate back now. They're actually the most common species of crane worldwide, so they have the highest population numbers of any crane species in the world. Uh, and we also have the whooping crane in North America, which is the most rare species of crane uh, with the fewest numbers of individuals worldwide. Um, like I mentioned, both of these species have populations that breed in Wisconsin. So we have a reintroduced population of whooping cranes that breed here in Wisconsin and migrate to the southeast for the winter. And we also have breeding sandhill cranes in Wisconsin. So this is one of the few places in the world that you can see breeding populations of these two species. So our, uh, our wetlands and ecosystems in Wisconsin are very important for the breeding populations of of both crane species. And to just give you all a kind of an idea about the ecology of cranes or the bi biology of cranes, um, they are a long-lived species living up to 30 years in the wild. Um, they generally reach sexual maturity at two to three years of age and at that point they, they uh, gain a mate or they find a mate and a territory hopefully. Um, cranes roost and nest in wetlands uh, and tend to feed during the day in open or upland or wetland areas for food. Um, whooping cranes tend to be more wetland dependent than sandhill cranes in general. Um, they are omnivorous, so their diets range from small vertebrates, mammals, uh, birds, reptiles, to inverts, fruit grains, uh, and tubers, that sort of thing. Uh, breeding pairs are highly territorial and phylopatric. So pairs return to the same territory year after year and defend these territories throughout the spring, summer, and fall months. These territories can range in size, uh, but they are generally small, consisting of a wetland area for nesting and an upland area for foraging. Uh, the incubation period for both species is, is about 30 days. Um, and chicks first start taking test flights at approximately 70 
days of age for sandhills and a little bit later, about 80 days for whooping cranes uh, with, with chicks then becoming fully fledged one to two weeks later. Um, there is a large non-breeding population. So non-breeding or non-territorial individuals make up about half of the population. Uh, these are immature birds or they could be mature birds that don't have mates or territories as well. Uh, these cranes roost in wetlands, uh, move in small groups or flocks, uh, and they're generally more mobile than territorial birds, uh, moving up to two miles from roosting sites uh, to foraging grounds during the day. Uh, just to give you kind of a general idea or general rhythm of a year in the life of a crane, uh, spring migra migration is actually happening right now. We've had a lot of, I've seen a bunch of sandhill cranes already back in Wisconsin. Um, so birds are migrating back at this period of time. Um, and those, arrive, those birds that are arriving right now are usually uh, paired birds that are returning to territory. So the earlier you can return to your territory in the spring, the better you have, uh, the better chance you have of defending that territory from other pairs that may want that territory. So arrival on territories that is early allows for this defense uh, in pairs. Um, a little bit later in the spring, we, we start nest initiation, maybe a month from now or so. Chicks will hatch then about, again, another month or so from there, about 30 days incubation for both species. And then those chicks fledge um, about, like I said, 80 to 90 days later, depending on, the, depending on the species. You can see in this picture, actually, this is, a, this is not four adult cranes. This is a family group of two chicks. And those chicks are, are fledged at this point. They're actually even gaining that little uh, red, spot, red patch on the top of their heads at this point. Uh, after those birds fledge in fall, uh, we start to get uh, fall migration occurring, uh, birds moving south generally, and then overwintering locations. So this, this shows a map of actually the Christmas bird count uh, for numbers of sandhill cranes uh, around, the, around Christmas time. And you can actually see that in the wintertime nowadays, um, we actually do have sandhill cranes that are spending time in the Midwest. You have a fair number of cranes still in Wisconsin, Michigan, um, sandhill cranes and whooping cranes spend a lot of winters in Indiana as well. So cranes aren't necessarily all flying down south to Florida for, for the winter, but they're staying sometimes uh, further north than, than in the past, actually. So this map depicts the distribution of sandhill cranes across their breeding and wintering ranges. Um, sandhill cranes are generalists and they're very adaptable. So uh, to many different landscapes, which led them to become the most numerous crane species in the world. The population now is about, is probably about 1 million individuals. Uh, there are distinct populations of sandhill cranes um, and those would include three non-migratory subspecies. The Cuban sandhill crane, the Mississippi sandhill crane, which is actually a critically endangered subspecies of sandhill crane, and the Florida sandhill crane. So these, these three subspecies are all non-migratory. And in addition to these non-migratory subspecies, there are three migratory subspecies, the greater sandhill crane, lesser, and the Canadian. Obviously the greater is the, is the tallest um, sandhill crane uh, subspecies, lesser is the smallest, and the Canadian is, is somewhere in the middle. Um, they're found in various populations throughout the continent and beyond. You can actually see there are uh, breeding areas for sandhill cranes in Siberia as well. Uh, so these uh, migratory populations include the mid-continent population, which number at this point probably over 800,000 uh, individual birds, which is the largest uh, migratory population of sandhill cranes. The Pacific popula population, the Rocky Mountain population, the lower Colorado River Valley population, and then the Eastern population of sandhill cranes, which, uh, of which, which Wisconsin sandhills are a part of. And um, Wisconsin, uh, the Eastern population is made up of only greater sandhill cranes. Some of those other populations have a mix uh, of the three subspecies, but the Eastern population of sandhill cranes is only uh, greater sandhill cranes. So this is the distribution map for whooping cranes, including their historic range, which is the areas in green here. So uh, first thing you might notice is that the areas are a little bit smaller than they are for sandhill cranes. So whooping cranes um, were never as common as sandhill cranes, and that's partly due, be, due to the fact that they're more wetland dependent species. Um, so they have a little bit more specific needs for habitat. 
Um, they're not as much of a generalist as sandhill cranes are, so they're not able to utilize the upland or agricultural areas to the same extent. They do use some upland and agricultural areas, but they, they definitely spend more time in the wetlands. Um, historically, there were both migratory and non-migratory populations of whooping cranes as well. Most recently, there was a population of non-migratory whooping cranes in Gulf Coastal Louisiana. Um, and in the 1940s, the population of whooping cranes worldwide was very low. So the numbers were down to maybe 14 or 15 individuals. And those birds were migrating between uh, Wood Buffalo National Park in Canada, which is the kind of gray shape that you see there on the map with the longest arrow. And they would migrate down to the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge in Gulf Coastal Texas. Um, once that population was sort of discovered and we realized how few individuals there were, the whooping cranes were put on the endangered species list, uh, which for, afforded them some additional protections and um, tools that we could use to help the population recover. And that included uh, starting a captive breeding program. So um, eggs were taken from some of the nests to hatch in captivity where now there are breeding birds in captivity who are hatching and raising chicks for release into reintroduced populations. So the other colors and uh, populations that you see on this map are some of the reintroductions either historically or that are currently ongoing, including the Eastern migratory population, uh, which is the black circle and arrow. Uh, that is the population that I work with and they breed in Wisconsin and winter down in the Southeast, not necessarily down in Florida, but um, sort of anywhere Southeast of Wisconsin. So part of uh, the reason for the decline of both whooping cranes, but also sandhill cranes historically was the loss of wetland habitat. So cranes, whooping cranes and sandhill cranes in particular need wetlands for breeding. That's where they build their nests on the ground. You can see in this picture on the left, this is a, a typical nest um, for a whooping crane, but also would look similar for a sandhill crane. So they use marsh vegetation to pile up on the ground for nesting. And they also use wetlands for roosting as well as foraging. Um, so with Western expansion, there was a lot of loss of wetland habitats throughout North America, uh, which impacted both sandhill cranes and whooping cranes. Um, and uh, in addition to that, there was also market hunting for the birds, for the meat and their feathers. So with the listing of whooping cranes on the Endangered Species Act, as well as through the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and other protections for migratory birds, as well as protections for wetland habitats across North America. Um, some of those threats were reduced and we started to see population increases for both species. For whooping cranes in particular, uh, like I mentioned, uh, another way that we tried to help increase their populations is through captive rearing and reintroduction. So you may have seen um, either a whooping crane costume like you see here on the left or maybe the ultralight planes that you see on the bottom. So these are some of the tools that have been used in the past for reintroducing whooping cranes into the wild. So ways that we've raised whooping cranes so that they're imprinting on something that looks like a whooping crane even though it also kind of looks like a person in a crane costume. Um, and then teaching them the migratory path via the crane costumed person flying an ultralight plane and the cranes following them south on the migration. So that helped establish a migratory population and now we have adult individuals that are making those migrations every year and we're able to do some different types of captive rearing including parent rearing which is the picture that you see on the right where a young whooping crane is raised still in captivity by adult whooping cranes and then released into the wild where they follow other cranes on their migration south. So we're hoping that this will um, help us raise cranes that have been reared by other cranes and maybe are learning different behaviors that we're not able to teach them as people in crane costumes. So all of this has led to an increase in the number of whooping cranes in the world. Currently there is over 800 whooping cranes um, 
which is much better than the, the 14 or 15 that there were historically. So um, this includes about 160 whooping cranes that are in captivity. They're either a part of an educational program or a part of the captive breeding program. Uh, there's about 500 in that uh, historic wild flyaway, the Ramseswood buffalo population that I mentioned that breed in Canada and migrate down to Texas. And then we have a few reintroduced populations. The Eastern migratory, like I mentioned, is the one that breeds in Wisconsin. There's about 80 individuals in that population. Um, the Louisiana non-migratory population is another reintroduction. Uh, that has about 70 individuals there. And then there was a Florida non-migratory population that was also reintroduced. Um, we stopped releasing birds in that population, but there still are a few that remain there. So looking at the little bit of the history of sandhill cranes in Wisconsin, um, the populations of sandhills actually dropped to such low numbers in the early 1900s uh, and in, the, in the Midwest. Uh, they dropped to such low numbers, numbers that in the 1940s, Aldo Leopold actually believed that cranes could be lost from Wisconsin altogether, as he wrote in a Martian elegy in this quote you can see here. Um, in fact, surveys in Wisconsin in the 1930s found only 25 breeding pairs throughout the state. So it's interesting to note too that studies of sandhill cranes in Wisconsin at this time actually documented that they fed on corn in the springtime, uh, possibly an early indication of crop damage, uh, but with only a small crane population at the time, the damage was likely minimal. We'll obviously talk a little bit more about crop damage later. So like Hillary said, due to factors like the implementation of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, reduction of wetland loss, um, as well as uh, the species uh, ability to adapt to different habitats and different environments, the species uh, population has recovered really well since the early 1900s. Um, with fall surveys now estimating possibly around 90,000 cranes in, the, in all of the eastern population. So you can see in this, on this graph to the left, um, the fall population counts that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service conducts. Um, you can see an important thing to note that for this graph, um, the new, that new survey areas are actually being added on a yearly basis, which may be partially responsible for this high increase uh, in the count, but you can see the population is doing very well here in the Midwest. Wisconsin sandhill cranes are estimated to account for anywhere from one half to one third of the overall population. So here in Wisconsin, uh, we can see the breeding distribution of sandhill cranes across the state over time, according to the Wisconsin Breeding Bird Atlas Survey. So you can see the, the atlas, uh, the surveys conducted from 1995 to 2000, and then the surveys that were just finished up uh, conducted from 2015 to 2019. So these maps really do show an increase in breeding sandhill cranes throughout Wisconsin over the last 20 years or so, uh, especially in areas uh, in the south central and southeastern parts of the state. So here at the International Crane Foundation, we've actually been conducting long-term studies on sandhill cranes for over 30 years in Wisconsin, uh, near a town called Briggsville. So if you look at the map on the left-hand side, the red star is actually uh, ICF headquarters located in Sauk County. And uh, our study area is located about 30 minutes away uh, to the northeast of our headquarters. Uh, our study area is approximately 30 square miles. And you can see on the map on the right, the area is made up of uh, mixed agricultural lands. So you can see the wetlands in blue. Crop fields are denoted in yellow, forested areas, as well as short grass, tall grass areas. Um, so this is just a farming community. Um, we work with local landowners to conduct this research uh, in the study area. It's all privately owned. Um, so we've been doing work out here for a really long time. So why would we be interested in studying sandhill cranes in Wisconsin? Populations are doing really well. Um, well, in addition to kind of accumulating this long-term data set that we have um, in a breeding area. We use this study area to train students and interns as well as uh, visiting colleagues uh, and to utilize the area as kind of an outdoor classroom and an experimental laboratory where we can test different methodologies uh, for studying behaviors, doing different types of observations or different types of technologies, uh, either for banding birds, for catching birds, uh, uh, transmitters for putting on birds, that sort of thing that these new methodologies and technologies may help inform other researchers. They help inform us about uh, other populations, about this population. They also, information kind of goes to help the reintroduction effort for, for whooping cranes. 
So how exactly have we been studying uh, sandhill cranes in the study area? Well, we started a banding program in 1990. Um, and so through the banding, in some cases, radio transmitter placement on breeding and non-breeding -individu non uh, individuals, this allows us to make observations and track birds over a long period of time, sometimes throughout the whole crane's life. Um, our current Sandhill Crane database has over 48,000 observations in it. So we see these birds a lot. The breeding birds come back year after year and we can kind of track uh, their, their progress throughout their lives. We've banded over 500 uh, individuals uh, during this project as well. So we use a similar method to study whooping cranes. You can see um, the whooping crane on the left also has different colors on their leg bands, uh, different banding schemes to the sand hills that you see in these pictures. Um, but in all situations, the color combination and which leg the bands are on will help us identify individuals. So by being able to tell which bird is which, we can learn a lot about the bird throughout their lifetime. Um, we also use different types of telemetry. So the whooping crane here, you can see there's an antenna sticking off one of the leg bands. So we use leg band mounted transmitters. In this case, it's a VHF transmitter, uh, which means that it sends off a unique frequency and if we're out in the field, we can tune our receivers to that frequency. Uh, we can listen for a signal with an antenna. And depending on which direction our antenna is pointing, we can uh, help, help us find the crane so we can tell which direction the crane is in. Uh, we also use some remote transmitters that collect GPS points and send them to us uh, remotely. So either via satellite or through cell phone network. Um, so we're able to track them even if we're not out in the field or if they're migrating somewhere farther south, uh, we can follow their movements that way. So we use a combination of leg bands and different types of transmitters to collect different types of data on cranes, um, but we do rely heavily on the colored leg bands because uh, those will be on the bird for the, the lifetime of the bird or until we take them off or replace them. Um, so we're able to track those long-term data sets as well. So for whooping cranes uh, in Wisconsin, almost every single one, with a couple of exceptions, has leg bands on them. Uh, for sandhill cranes, it's really a subset, So, um, but keep your eyes peeled because you never know where a banded crane will turn up. And if you do happen to see a banded crane, a sandhill crane, or a whooping crane, please let us know. You can uh, report it to us on our website at bandedcranes.org, and we can try to figure out which bird you saw and, and tell you a little bit about that bird. So that really helps us. And it's also a fun way to connect with individual birds as well. I think it's important note to note too that uh, different researchers across the United States and across Canada use different banding schemes uh, to band the birds that they catch. So if you see a bird with a, a band combination that looks dissimilar from the ones you see here, you can always uh, email us too and we'll get that information to the, to the researcher who banded that bird. So what are kind of the, some of the things we've learned uh, from banding birds in this study area uh, over the years? We, we can learn about general biology things like uh, longevity, uh, pair fidelity, nesting density and productivity of, of sandhill cranes in this population. We can also obviously learn some things uh, and help reintroduction techniques for, for whooping cranes in Wisconsin as well. So just to kind of uh, look at some of the things we've learned, um, longevity, uh, we get all of that information from simply band reciting so we can track these birds year after year. We have a really interesting case um, in our study area, uh, including a pair of cranes that was first banded as a breeding pair in 1993. Um, so this pair we call EB, uh, Looks like we've uh, we've lost Andrew. I can um, I can fill in if you can hear me, but I'm not sure since he's uh, advancing our slides. I'm not sure if I'll be able to do that. I um, I can bring up the slides and share on on my side. Um, sure. So let me just bring that up quick. 
Sure, I'll just talk about this, this story while you're doing that. So this pair uh, was banded in 1993 as adults. So they were at least two or three years old by the time they were banded. And um, they had their bands replaced in 2011. So the, these green bands are the old ones. The one above the silver band actually used to be red. So it did fade over time. Um, they've been on the same territory this whole time and they've uh, bred each year and they've raised at least 13 chicks, including one from this past year. So these birds are at least 30 years old and um, just kind of show how old sandhill cranes can live and they're still still reproducing. So um, that's one fun thing that we've learned from the longevity data. Okay, so I, I, I am sharing my, my screen now until we get Andrew back. So just let me know when you need me to okay, advance. You can and go to the next slide. Um, Jennifer, we are not seeing your screen. We are still seeing Andy's screen, which is frozen in. I, um, okay. You'll need to take control of it. Okay, so just a second here. Are, are you seeing... You're still seeing uh yeah we are still seeing andrews let's see here let me see if i can yeah it's not allowing me to stop sharing his screen for some reason let me see if i can do that as a host um i hate to do this but we may need to kick andy out of the meeting for the time being that might help um Okay, now you should be able to share your screen, Jennifer. Okay, um, I can see your screen, so I'll just, I'll let you know when to um, advance. So thanks, sorry about that, everybody. Um, I'll do my best to uh, fill you in on some of the Sandhill Crane work that really Andy is leading, so I apologize. Um, oh, now I'm seeing a website. Okay, so some of the work that we... Jennifer, you're going to need to leave the um, presentation up. I am sorry about that. Okay, so some of the work that um, we also do in our, our study area for long-term sandhill crane work is focusing on some of the human or crane interactions or issues that may come up as you do have a lot of sandhill cranes on the landscape. So one of those things is the issue of crop damage. Um, so we've done some studies in our study area um, looking at how we can resolve crop damage issues with sandhill cranes, particularly in cornfields. And we have also um, looked at power line collisions and, and ways that we can work with power line uh, siting or power companies to mark power lines to try to reduce um, mortalities for cranes. And this is, power line collisions are a threat to many species of cranes, not just sandhill cranes, certainly whooping cranes as well and other species of cranes worldwide. So uh, we try to sort of stay on top of some of the issues that might arise with having such an abundant population of cranes. Um, so we can try to keep their populations healthy, but also avoid any um, uh, conflict with, with people. Next slide. Andy, feel free to jump in if you're back online. Yeah, I'm here now, my camera is working now, so, um... so here's a picture of some of the, the power line divers. Um, so this is fine, yep. Um, Andy, are you? Yeah, I'm okay. I can. I can keep going. Go uh, ahead. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so talking about cranes and crop damage, uh, issues range uh, from potatoes to corn uh, to small grains. Here in the Midwest, uh, as the resident crane population has increased over the last half century or so, uh, some of these issues with crop damage, especially corn, have arisen. 
Um, so in the above, you can see some pictures of typical crane damage to newly germinated fields. Um, the picture on the lower left is one lone uh, corn seedling that made it, while the other ones, you can see the probe holes where the crane went right down the road, um, probing into the ground and picking up the, the corn kernel out of the ground. The picture on the right, you can actually see um, some dead corn plants on the side, and what the cranes do is they, they go under the ground and they actually pick up that corn kernel, uh, leaving the rest of the plant just there on the ground. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, just to look a little bit more closely at crop damage and cranes, for sandhills, the damage uh, to corn generally occurs over a small period of time. Uh, in the cornfield, cranes don't feed on the plant itself, but obviously focus on the seed underground. So this feed is only available from the time that uh, corn is planted to about, about 17 days post-germination and is most vulnerable uh, in the early germination phase uh, as the seed can be identified uh, by that newly germinated plant. So what the cranes do is that that corn is planted and once it first germinates, kind of comes up and shows the cran, hey, there's this corn kernel here and they will use that uh, corn seedling to identify that kernel in the ground um, and, and probe under and, and pick up that corn kernel. Uh, so uh, because of their behavior, uh, non-territorial cranes tend to cause more damage uh, in cornfields than, than territorial sandhill cranes. Territorial sandhill cranes at this period of time in the spring are generally nesting or have small chicks, which means they actually tend to stick close to wetlands. And if they have chicks, they're foraging on food items that are high in protein, such as inverts, um, to feed the chicks. It's also important to note that uh, territorial sandhill cranes will generally keep out non-territorial uh, non sandhill cranes, so those flocks sometimes will be held out of fields by these territorial, territorial individuals. Uh, Non-territorial cranes, on the other hand, are obviously just focused on available food items including corn, move further distances to forage uh, depending on availability. So these large flocks can do a great amount of damage compared to these territorial individuals uh, on the real estate. Next slide, please. So here in ICF study area, um, we were actually, I have actually worked with local farmers and tested the efficacy of, uh, of the treatment to put on the corn to deter cranes from doing crop damage. The chemical uh, form of this deterrent is known as anthraquinone. The trade name is Avapel. Um, and we did show with, with research that was done in our study area uh, that this is an effective treatment for deterring cranes from damaging the corn. Uh, and it's actually currently available on the market. So if you're having issues with, with corn or cranes doing damage to your corn fields, um, I would recommend this, this, this product uh, that would work uh, as deterring cranes. You may actually, a lot of farmers say that they can still feed cranes in their field after they after they put on this return, but that's likely cranes foraging on other items in that corn. It doesn't keep them out of the field, um, but it keeps them from damaging corn crops. Next slide, please. So for whooping cranes, um, you know, that are less abundant, we have uh, we don't have the same types of threats, uh, but one of the threats that we do have is really just low productivity. So um, by not having enough chicks that are being raised to fledging or that are recruiting into the population, um, it causes a sort of threat to the population's success. So uh, whooping cranes are still being reintroduced in Wisconsin. We are still releasing captive reared birds onto the landscape. Next slide, please. So this graph shows uh, the history of reproduction in the Eastern migratory population. So this population started being reintroduced in 2001 and the first nesting started in 2005. Um, so over time, the blue line is the number of nesting pairs and our goal that's a part of the recovery plan for the species is to have about 25 nesting pairs in the population or more. Um, we've been around 20 to 25 breeding pairs in the population for the past 10 years or so, so that's a good sign. Um, the yellow line at the bottom is the number of chicks fledged and the gray line is the number of chicks hatched. So you can see we've had quite a few chicks hatch in the last few years, um, but the number of chicks that are fledging is still remaining pretty low. Um, the 
yellow line isn't at zero, so that's encouraging. We, we have had a few more chicks fledge each year, uh, which is encouraging. So we just would like to see that yellow line keep increasing over time. Next slide. So what could be some reasons for this low fledging rate? Uh, the sort of two main ideas are that potentially there's something habitat related that's keeping the cranes from being able to rear their chicks to fledging. So uh, it could be you know, something that they're not getting that they need for their chicks to grow up, or maybe they're not having enough cover from predators or something habitat related that's keeping them from being able to raise their chicks to fledging. And the other idea is that maybe they're not, they're not knowing or learning some type of behavior that would help them be more successful parents. So since most of the cranes in this population have been raised in captivity, possibly they didn't learn something that they might've learned if they were a chick that was raised by cranes in the wild. So if you see your parents raising you up to fledging, maybe you remember something that they did that helps you raise your own chicks up to fledging. So uh, we're still kind of investigating these two um, sort of areas of, of research for why the population might not be self-sustaining yet. Next slide, please. So on the habitat side of things, uh, we have identified uh, nest abandonments at Nasita National Wildlife Refuge that have been caused by large populations of black flies. So the photo on the top is a photo of a whooping crane egg that is covered by black flies. Uh, and the problem really is that when the black flies hatch, they bother the birds so much that the, the whooping cranes will abandon their nests, abandon their eggs, and actually leave the marsh completely to get away from the flies. So since we were able to identify this as a problem, we have found some solutions to uh, help whooping cranes get through the nesting season and, and hatch more chicks on the landscape. So one of the ways that we do that is what we call forced re-nesting, where um, instead of letting the cranes sit on their eggs and be so bothered by black flies that they abandon them, we go out and take the eggs out of their nest before the black flies get really bad. And we bring those eggs into captivity and they become a part of the captive rearing program. So those chicks will then be released back into the wild in the fall. Uh, that also helps the cranes not be so stressed out by black flies. And then we have shown that it will actually increase the number of pairs that will lay a second clutch after the black flies have left the landscape and they're able to nest without black flies around and hatch their chicks um, a little bit later in the season. Additionally, we have tested other wetland areas around central and eastern Wisconsin for black flies and found some other areas where there may be fewer black flies around and have focused our release areas there for captive reared cranes uh, since 2011. So now we're starting to see some of those birds are establishing territories in these new release areas that have fewer black flies. And we're hoping that over time they will be more productive on their own without the need for us to go and take their first clutch of eggs. Uh, we are still monitoring nests and we're seeing more chicks hatching in the last few years. So that's encouraging. So then kind of the next phase or the next step for this population is to get those chicks that are hatching to the fledging stage where their rates of survival go way up. Next slide, please. So one way that we are studying this effect of habitat on whooping crane nest and productivity, uh, nest success and productivity is by looking at sandhill cranes that are nesting sometimes in the exact same marshes. So if sandhill cranes are able to hack it, then we expect that whooping cranes would too. So one of the ways that we have um, tried to look at effects of habitat is see if there's areas where maybe sandhill cranes aren't doing as well and therefore whooping cranes might not do as well or vice versa if there's areas where sandhill cranes are very productive maybe whooping cranes would do better in those areas as well. So um, that can kind of help us see if there is a habitat related factor as compared to a captive breeding or, or behavioral sort of factor. So in the 2019 season we monitored 
both whooping crane nests and sandhill crane nests. And a similar proportion of those nests hatched at least one chick. So 67% of the whooping crane nests and 74% of the sandhill crane nests that we monitored were successful in hatching a chick. So um, those are, are pretty good numbers. So we're happy to see that whooping cranes are doing about as well as sandhill cranes in that regard. Um, last year, we did a little bit different um, monitoring because of COVID. So uh, we'll continue that work this year. Uh, so focusing on the fledging side of things, we've also monitored wild hatched whooping crane chicks in Wisconsin, as well as sandhill crane chicks or colts as they're sometimes known. Uh, so during the 2017 to 2019 period, we, we monitored whooping crane colts or chicks at Nasita, and seven of the 32 that we uh, monitored reached fledging um, so right around 20-ish percent. Um, and then for sandhill cranes, we monitored colts, many more of them uh, during the same period of time and we found a similar rate of fledging. So a little bit higher for sandhills than for whooping cranes, but uh, overall pretty similar rates of fledging. You'll see on the bottom here that the uh, study site where we monitored sandhill cranes, there was a lot of variation. So only 5% of the colts at Nasita reached fledging, none of the colts at Horicon that we monitored reached fledging, and 47% of the sandhill cranes in our Briggsville study area reached fledging. So there may be some differences in habitat also for sandhill cranes where certain marshes may be better for them to raise their chicks. Um, that being said, I don't know if Briggsville is necessarily the best place for whooping cranes because it is such an agricultural landscape. So there's still some differences between the two species, um, but it is interesting to see such variation between our sites. Uh, and the last thing that I'll mention about that is that our, our sample size for those areas were really different. So we only monitored a handful of chicks at Nasita and, and Horicon and many more in Briggsville, but it still warrants further investigation. Next slide, please. So moving forward um, for whooping cranes, we will continue to investigate some of these reasons why their wild hatch chicks aren't surviving to fledging. And that might include looking at the role of parenting experience. So maybe they're just, it's a young population. It takes some time to get experience with hatching and raising chicks on their own and uh, hopefully they'll you know get better and better at raising chicks as they get more practice. Um, we'll keep looking at different effects of breeding habitat including in our new release areas so seeing if those birds are going to be more or less successful than our original release area at Nasita. Um, and we'll also look at potential predators of chicks or, or what are really the main drivers of that low productivity for whooping cranes in Wisconsin. So for sandhill cranes, we're, we're looking at a pretty healthy population here in Wisconsin and in the Midwest. We're, we're looking at it, uh, the expansion actually of the eastern population. There's a lot of birds now that are breeding in, in the northeast and places they weren't before, areas like Pennsylvania, New York, Vermont. Um, have small uh, populations of sandhill cranes from the eastern population. Um, so we're looking at that. We're also looking at human wildlife conflict and interactions like that, um, where we have issues with power lines, crop damage, also birds moving into more populated, populated areas where there's a lot of people, uh, can cause a lot of issues, uh, can lead to injuries to cranes or mortality in cranes, also uh, destruction of property. Uh, people's property can be uh, damaged by cranes and that sort of thing. So we're looking into those aspects of, of sandhill crane research now. Next slide. Right. Uh, and with that, we can uh, uh, take some questions. Thank you. Yeah, and apologies for the te technical difficulties earlier. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm also sorry about that. I didn't mean to show everybody my email or you know what I'm doing, but that was <laughs> my part. Thank you for your patience. Um, so yeah, we can start with some questions here. And uh, so I'm going to say first, um, what is the relationship with the Crane Foundation and potato growers? And I say I know sandhill cranes have been known to peck at potatoes. Yes, they have, and they they can. What they do is they're they're probing for 
for things in the ground um, and they, they will expose potatoes um, and put holes in potatoes. And that is an issue. We have worked with the uh, potato growers. We have looked at anthroquinone uh, on potatoes. It, it doesn't seem to be a, a, a good treatment for, for potatoes and crop damage, um, but we have worked with those landowners and we're, we're trying to figure out ways to um, kind of stop crop damage with potatoes as well. So that's a, that's a bit of a tougher one than corn. Great. Um, and then, um, so another question uh, that kind of goes off of what you were just talking about is this, the, so the corn seeds that are treated with the chemicals, uh, with, does that hurt the cranes at all? Uh, no, we haven't found any uh, effects on the cranes. Um, it's a, the anthraquinone is kind of a naturally occurring chemical that, that uh, fruiting plants have. So they, they, emit this this chemical before before the fruit reaches maturity so it's kind of derived from that that sort of chemical um, and we haven't seen any effects on the birds uh, the cranes in our population are still doing really well um, we haven't seen an increase in mortality or anything like that so yeah the chemical just makes the corn seed taste bad so once they yeah. taste it they they stop eating it yeah we've seen them actually spit it out before where they they they'll test the corn um, and, and they'll, they'll find that they don't like it and then they'll, yeah, they'll spit it out pretty quickly. Um, so they don't, they don't necessarily ingest a lot of it. Okay. And then, um, so someone asked, where are the, where are the captive whooping crane chicks, chicks raised and at what point are they released? Yeah, so uh, the International Crane Foundation is one of the main breeding centers for whooping crane chicks. So we raise uh, many of them at our headquarters in Baraboo. But we also work with other institutions through the um, captive breeding program. So there's other facilities that also will hatch and raise whooping crane chicks. Uh, for example, the Audubon Species Survival Center in Louisiana is another big one. Uh, White Oak Conservation in Florida, uh, Calgary Zoo in Canada, um, and a couple of zoos in Texas also are part of the captive breeding program. So they are raising captive reared whooping crane chicks, not only for the Eastern migratory population, but also for the Louisiana non-migratory population. And we do a combination of costume rearing as well as parent rearing uh, for the releases into those two populations. Um, the whooping cranes in the eastern migratory population will get released typically in the fall. So we wait until they're able to fly because we don't want to take a naive crane who has never been in the wild before and also can't fly uh, and put them into the wild. That would be a pretty scary thing for them and for us. So we wait until they're old enough to be able to fly so they can check out different areas, get to appropriate habitat, find other cranes and get away from predators. But we also want to maximize the time that they have on the breeding grounds before they have to migrate. So they have time to acclimate to life in the wild. They can stretch their wings, get some of those flight muscles built up before they have to migrate. So it's kind of a, a balance between when the cranes are old enough, but also early enough that they have time to uh, get the lay of the land before they have to migrate. And um, the release sites that we use are dependent on kind of where there are whooping cranes. So we want to try to release them near other cranes that they can follow south on their migration. Excellent. Um, so does science say we're any closer to a sandhill hunt? That's a tough one too. Um, there, there are a couple of states uh, throughout the, the flyway. The eastern population does have hunting seasons in Kentucky and Tennessee. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure about the, the population. The, the, the issues that we see um, with the crane hunt have to do with uh, the reasons behind it being crop damage, uh, being one of the reasons. And a fall hunt doesn't necessarily stop crop damage um, from happening. Um, so, so we're, we're kind of trying to look at, you know, population levels. We're still trying to learn more about this population. What exactly is the population in Wisconsin? We don't know. Also worried about um, an inordinate number of uh, local sandhill cranes being hunted possibly in the fall. If there is a hunt, 
um, and doing damage to the breeding population here in Wisconsin at higher levels than we would want. So there's there's a lot of issues that that you kind of have to look at with with the hunting of sandhill cranes here in Wisconsin. It's a tough issue. Um, we understand that we're trying to we're trying to add some data to it uh, with the work that we've been doing with sandhill cranes in this in this uh, population, uh, this, the one we study for a long time, and um, we're, we're we're working on it. I'm not sure if there's any more questions, but I'll just take a second to. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Let you... Oh, no worries. Mic was off. I had myself. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. I, I just I wanted. To, myself, but... I so, just wanted to mention that our uh, headquarters at the Crane Foundation has been closed for the past couple of years while we've been undergoing a, a major renovation. And we had hoped to open last year during 2020, but we obviously didn't because of COVID. Um, but we are now planning a soft reopening starting May 1st of 2021, and there will be timed reservations uh, to try to make sure that we're maintaining social distance and have lots of safety precautions in place. So if you're interested in coming to visit us at the Crane Foundation, um, we'll be open after May 1st, and you can head to our website to find out more about how to make a reservation. Um, personally, I'll say I'm very excited for the opening because the new exhibit areas are really beautiful. So I encourage you to come come visit us if you're able to. That was actually the next question. Somebody was All right. asking, <laughs> people were asking if, you, if you ever host events at the Baraboo facility or how and or if visitors are allowed to see the operations. So because you, you do tours of the facility too, too as well. Yeah, in a normal year, we would have group tours and we would have a series of events over the course of the summer. Um, I think some of that will be a little bit played by ear this year, but I think to start with, we probably won't have tours in the normal sense of the word, but um, we'll have some self-guided options and um, some, you know, some different information for people while they're out on our site. But you can certainly, um, like I said, make a reservation to come come visit us or if you want to, you know, hold off till the summer, there might be a few more things available, um, but really it's just, you know, trying to monitor the COVID situation and make decisions to keep everybody safe, but we are excited to share our new site with you all. Excellent. Um, so now there was another question about uh, sandhill cranes and whooping cranes. So, so are there more stressors for whooping cranes than there are for sandhill cranes? It seems that sandhills are a bit more hardy. I don't know if they're necessarily more hardy. Um, they definitely are more adaptable. So, um, you know, whooping cranes are about a foot taller than sandhill cranes. And uh, they do, I mean, when I think of hardy, I think of like cold hardy. And they do, they are pretty tough. You know, they're a tough bird. They're, uh, they can survive a lot of cold temperatures. They're also pretty aggressive and territorial. So they can scare off a lot of predators and things. I know they sometimes scare me off. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of stressors or, or, uh, you know, why their populations aren't rebounding as much as sandhill cranes, I think really it just has to do with their dependence on wetlands and, and the amount of wetlands that we've lost in this, in this continent over time. So they're a little bit less able to be adaptable, um, like sandhill cranes that can make better use of those upland areas that are sometimes dom dominated by agriculture. So I think, um, I think whooping cranes aren't necessarily uh, uh, facing more threats or stressors. They're just, there's just not as much of what they need around. So it's just a matter of trying to navigate some new, new types of wetlands that we have and, and making sure that we protect the wetlands that we do have. Do you have anything to add to that, Andy? <laughs> no, that sounds about right. I, I, I just, while you were talking, I thought of the Number of times I've seen whooping cranes chase off sandhill cranes. They're definitely more of a dominant species. They're more dominant to sandhill cranes. Um, yeah. they, will, they will flush off uh, sandhill cranes and they do tend to be a little meaner to sandhill cranes. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes <laughs> I dominant. see whooping cranes, I think they're just chasing sandhill cranes for the fun of it. They might be, yeah, who knows? If you think about like their natural history, you know, their whooping cranes are all white. They're they're meant to stand out on the landscape. So they want to be seen. They want other animals to know, 
hey, this is my area, I'm here, and don't even think about coming here. And sandhill cranes, you know, they're a little bit more camouflage. They're brown or gray. They blend in more with the vegetation around them. Their, their strategy is to fly under the radar a little bit more. So it kind of makes sense. Interesting. Um, There's so another question about the, the um, I can't remember the name of it now, but the, the chemical treated seeds. Uh, it's, uh, so they're asking, do those seeds affect water quality at all? Or the chemical on the seeds, does that affect water quality? Um, that I'm not, I'm not sure of. I haven't, I haven't uh, heard of any tests they did on water quality. Um, the chemical only lasts on the seed until it, it, it reaches that level where there's no seed. So it's, you know, 17 days post germination or whatever. Um, but I know I haven't heard of that, the chemical like being leached in the, in the water um, or anything like that. I don't, I don't know specifics on that. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, and then um, can you talk a little bit more about your international research? Uh, someone here says they were lucky enough to see saurus cranes in Cambodia, and how's the population worldwide? Yeah, that's a, a big question, I guess, because there are so many different species of cranes. Um, so like I said, there's 15 species of cranes worldwide, 11 of those are threatened or endangered. Um, many of the threatened and endangered species, the Crane Foundation has project areas that uh, focus on recovery of those species. Um, there are certainly lots of areas of overlap, as you might imagine. You know, even though we're looking at cranes all across the world and very different landscapes, there's, you know, they face some of the same threats. So, for example, um, like Andy had mentioned, the um, power line work that we've done with sandhill cranes, um, we've done in concert really a lot of it with our staff in South Africa who are looking at power line collisions on cranes in South Africa. Um, similarly with um, whooping cranes, you know, we're, we're in the process still of this long-term reintroduction effort and there's other crane species that are undergoing reintroductions as well. So there's a SARS crane reintroduction in Thailand or there's a Eurasian crane reintroduction in England um, are just a couple examples of that. So. I think you know being an international nonprofit really allows us to leverage some of the tools and, and knowledge that we've gained across the world and apply that to different species. So um, the Crane Foundation has offices in Asia and in Africa, as well as in North America. And um, we do have all staff meetings every other week with our staff all around the world. And so it is really encouraging to hear about all the different projects that we have going on with cranes all around the world. Um, you know, some of them are doing better than others, but I think having that partnership and being that kind of central hub for crane work has really benefited cranes. Excellent. Um, so now uh, there's someone asking, are you familiar with the group that is working with the Corps of Engineers on military bases to increase wetlands on their flyways? Yeah, so that um, group is mostly focused on uh, whooping crane stopover habitat in the central flyways, so the Aransas wood buffalo population, and they've really been able to uh, make a lot of connections and get a lot of really good habitat uh, work, providing habitat for migrating whooping cranes. Uh, throughout that flyway, so um, that's not a project that I'm directly involved with, but I have heard about it and and it sounds really interesting so they're you know working with partners especially with the army corps of engineers to you know try to make sure that some of the wetlands that are in that flyway are appropriate for whooping cranes that are going to be good safe places for them to stop over on their long migration Okay, we have two minutes left. So if, you have, uh, if anybody has any more questions, feel free to, to drop them in. Uh, we ha only have two minutes, but there is somebody who has commented that uh, Sandhills have returned to the Appleton area on, as of Saturday. So life is better. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I know I saw my first Sandhill of the year on Friday. So it, it definitely feels good to hear their calls. And, um, you know, I went for a walk this weekend and I could hear a couple of territorial pairs of sandhill cranes disputing where the territory line was already. So um, 
definitely makes me feel good and makes, makes me excited for spring and for the return of the whooping cranes as well. There's a few that are starting to trickle into the state, but um, I'm sure there'll be more and more coming back soon. Yeah, I haven't seen any in my neck of the woods yet. Also in Dodge County, someone says, but I'm in central Wisconsin, but I also haven't been out a ton, but I haven't seen any yet, but I'm sure they're, I'm, I look forward to them. To me, they are, they are the sure sign of spring. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Definitely. Well, we are just about at um, 1045. Uh, we don't have any additional questions coming in. So I'd just like to take a moment to, to thank you, uh, Hillary, and thank you, Andrew, for taking the time to speak with us today and to uh, share your, your knowledge on, on cranes. And, and again, this is a, was a really interesting and informative presentation. So thank you so much for being part of this uh, Waters Week. Yeah, thanks thank for you. having us.